Well, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be, whatever time it may be for you. Um, this is uh, Professor Barry, Tom. I'm here coming right at you from my living room. Um, it's a smoky day. Hopefully you're, you and your family members and your friends are all, uh, all well. Man, it's just pretty, been a pretty wild year for sure. Feel for all those people who've been impacted by, by these fires. Um, yeah, so the goal for these, this, these lectures, this first one here, this first installment of 11, is to provide you some background information, things that may be helpful to kind of get you kind of uh, exposed to the main ideas and perspectives, uh, make kind of the readings uh, have more meaning to you. It's like, okay, why, why these readings or why these podcasts? Uh, just to kind of provide some of that, that kind of structure around the class that we would get in a face-to-face -face class. I'll try to keep these between... Um, I don't know, 15 and uh, 30 minutes. Um, so I think, you know, any, any more time than that, it's just easy to lose our attention span. At least I know it is for me. Uh, just watching a screen, uh, it can be uh, a, little, a little tiring. So just try to be focused, right? That's sort of the idea. So if you, if you have the schedule, if you looked at the week schedule, the for week one, basically, uh, you got a few things going on here. One, make sure you've done the uh, attendance requirement. Complete that by Wednesday night. Uh, in order to stay in the class. Uh, if it's not completed, I will, you know, drop you from the class, just kind of standard protocol. Um, and then you have basically uh, two different quizzes, one of them over the colony article, the three sociological perspectives, and the other quiz over both Grazian articles, functionalism and conflict theory. And both of those are due on Sunday by Sunday night, midnight is when those are due. And then you have the group wiki. Uh, I will assi assign you into a, into a group by by third by Wednesday. Actually, I might do that earlier in the week, but sometime between um, like Monday, Tuesday, I'll sign everyone into a group. Um, if you end up registering later than Monday or Tuesday, then I will uh, get you make sure you get into a group. That way you can get started. Um, then you have the question for the group wiki. Basically, it's just providing examples and illustrations. Um, uh, stuff that we've, you know, that, that, that have been part of the reading for the week. Okay, so that's kind of, that's, uh, that's the idea. That's kind of where we're going. That's what's going on. So let me kind of provide you a little bit of background about sociology, the three, the or the two, three theories and the two that we're going to focus on for this particular week. Um, if you have had sociology before, you got a background in it, I mean, you, you're, you, uh, you have the struggle, you have the main, you have the concept, right? You kind of know what sociology is all about. If you've never taken sociology before, uh, you kind of like, you know, it's like, okay, what, what are we getting, what am I getting myself into? What is this discipline called sociology? Um, so that's kind of like what our, my goal here is just kind of explain what is sociology, why is it beneficial, um, and what does it sort of provide us? So sociology defined, it's the systematic study of society. So we're basically trying to examine society. To do that, we have to go from the micro level, from the individual level, all the way to the macro level, looking at institutions and structures. Um, there's, I make us spend a lot of time talking about what, where sociology comes from, uh, kind of main ideas and perspectives, but I think maybe for now, the, what to focus on is that sociology is, the goal of sociology or the focus is to study society, try to understand what is going on in society or societies, uh, we can look at contemporary society, we can go back to previous societies, uh, we can look at our own culture now and the past. It's basically trying to understand society and depending on the theory to change society. So even functionalism as a theory, the, I mean, functionalism provided a vantage point, um, provided evidence information, provided a way to examine society, um, with the intent of recreating society to make it more effective, to make it more function more smoothly, right? So from a functionalist viewpoint, the idea is that we study society to order to correct it so we can make it more well-functioning. From a Marxist or conflict theory perspective, it's, it's, it's examination of society and it's intended to examine the inequalities in, in society or I should back up to say, let's examine uh, society. Some societies have more inequality than others. Some of that inequality is generated or caused by 
the kind of economic structure of that particular society. So in a capitalist system, capitalism, a byproduct of capitalism is a certain type of inequality. Uh, the conflict theory perspective is engaged in discussions of looking at inequities um, of race, class, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, other areas of difference. Looking at how society is structured to benefit some at the, and disadvantage others. And that's particularly true in a system uh, that's organized under uh, economic system of capitalism. Uh, humans haven't always been, human societies have, have not always been organized that way. So that's a critique that, that conflict theory will, will provide. And then the interactionist perspective, you know, a little bit of that about trying to change society maybe with interactionism. Um, overall, it's, it's trying to understand, right? So interactionism gets us to a lot of the micro level things, self-concept, identity, development, perceptions and meaning. A lot of stuff in the, in the interactionist perspective comes, you know, that's what we address in the interactionist perspective. I would say that functionalism and, and uh, conflict theory were both intentionally, the, those theoretical branches are there to study, examine, and provide recommendations for changing systems. From a micro level, the interactionist perspective is like we're trying to understand, trying to understand issues of identity, perceptions, meaning, language, all these different things that are going on in society, a little bit more micro level. It could lead us into policy level decisions like trying to change society, but not necessarily so. So anyway, that's overall the framework of sociology. If you're interested, check out C. Wright Mills and the Sociological Imagination. Uh, you can get a quick video summary, um, a quick article uh, of his called the Sociological Imagination. Um, and both of those, those would be helpful in terms of understanding what sociology is. Sociology encourages us to think outside of the individual and look at social forces. So it's looking at, you know, it's easy, it's, it can be very tricky, right, in our cultural environment where we place a lot of focus on individual, individual accountability and responsibility. But I would argue that to understand the individual behavior, individual action, the individual itself, you have to understand the systems in which we're operating in. So to say individual responsibility and individual accountability without saying system responsibility and accountability, to me is very fundamentally problematic, right? So I can, you know, if we look at criminality, we look at patterns of crime, there's strong evidence that indicates that part of that, that a significant element of crime is facilitated by degrees of inequality, race and class in particular. And you know, a focus on like individual, account individual accountability and responsibility without taking into consideration and putting under the microscope the systems that we're living in only reinforces a system of inequality, privilege, and disadvantage. So, you know, the sociology can, can be tricky in that way because we have to take the, the world that we've taken for granted, the world that maybe, that maybe that we're socialized into, the world that we develop strong beliefs about, how it should be, and start to question some of those things. Uh, start to examine them more analytically, more theoretically, um, and trying to basically, trying to understand society um, as it is, not, um, so that, that, and that requires pulling kind of layers of misunderstanding away. Um, and then engaged in the sort of the project of trying to uh, assist societies becoming more democratic and demonstrating democratic ideals. Okay, so that's kind of the main idea. So the Colony article, if you've taken sociology before, you haven't, I think that the Colony article is a great article, provides you a foundation of the three theoretical, theoretical perspectives. Um, I also include some videos for the, in that week one folder on the, on the three theoretical perspectives. Uh, there's a lot, of you know, a lot of videos out there that you can use to kind of explore the main ideas of the three theories. We will use them throughout the course of the term, so get familiar with them. Um, the articles for this week kind of help you on the way and the videos will be helpful as well. So what I'd like to do is just kind of give you like a few different things about each of the different theories. I've talked about them a little bit already, but just give you a little bit more information about the three theories, some things that I think are important to isolate or important to differentiate between the three. Okay, so for functionalism, let's start off with macro level theories. If the macro level are looking at structures and institutions. Uh, the first one of looking at functionalism, oftentimes functionalism people identify Emile Durkheim, French theorist, who really be, 
uh, you know, became a significant figure in the development of modern day sociology because he advanced uh, research methods for sociology and the social sciences. He developed sort of a perspective that really launched sociology um, into um, the academic world. Uh, he gained a lot of credibility uh, because of Durkheim's work and because of what he did within the field. Durkheim studied a lot of different things. I mean, he was fascinated by, like, how do we study social structure? Let's look at different institutions. Let's look at different structures. He spent a lot of time looking at religion. This probably becomes the most relevant for our discussion of popular culture. Um, I also want to mention, you know, what his uh, kind of key work in the study of suicide. And suicide becomes this really important study because it, what Durkheim was doing with suicide is demonstrating that we can't look at the individual alone, right? So suicide is a personal decision. Um, it's, it's a personal, it's, it's very personal, right? It's very individual level in a way. But Durkheim said, you know, there's patterns of suicide. Certain groups, certain parts of the population are more likely to commit suicide than others. And because there's those patterns, no longer can we say it's just only individual choice. It's individual within context, it's individual within an environment. So Durkheim encouraged us to look outside of the individual and look at what he identified as social facts or environmental influences. So for example, with suicide, individuals who are less integrated into, into society are more likely to commit suicide. So individuals who are single, unattached, not connected to institutions, family, uh, dislocated, Individuals in these kind of environments would be more likely to commit suicide than individuals who um, have those kind of attachments and those kind of things. And I mean, his work has been really important for exploring those social forces that are related to something so personal as suicide. And people still draw on his work in researching and looking into suicide today. Another area that he studied was religion. Uh, and you think about one of the comparisons that we can start to make is that as we've moved from a more sacred order, this is sort of what Durkheim would sort of be talking about, with the rise of industrialism, um, industrialization, modernization, urbanization, and starting in the 18th century, for all intents and purposes, uh, that we moved away from a sacred order to a more secular. So religion had a different place in society in pre-modern societies versus today. Durkheim had raised a lot of questions about that. He was concerned about like, what happens when we're moving from one kind of social order to this other one that's more secular, based on different set of values and institutions, where it may be more difficult to get individuals integrated into society, around, particularly around a common core set of values. So this idea of a value consensus. So religion, he knows the ideas of religion become really important. Like in religion, we can start to have discussions about what's going on within popular culture today or modern day societies that has elements that are functions or that are things that, that happen within religious institutions, institutions um, that have functions for us today. So sports become an example. Sports are a way of creating um, integration into smaller groups, a way of developing important places of identity and meaning. Um, it's being part of a larger group and a larger entity in a world of 360 million individuals in this nation. How do we sort of sense, how do we develop a sense of belonging and connection? And through elements of popular culture, we can, we can, we can achieve some of those kind of, those kind of things. Rituals become really important too. So, you know, like how do we reinforce our values, our beliefs? How do we develop a sense of connection to the communities that we belong? And rituals are a really important part of doing that kind of work. Um, there are certain rituals that exist within popular culture, right? So a lot of the holidays and experiences around holidays, um, a lot of rituals involved in that shopping becomes a ritual in a lot of ways. Um, so, we're going to take these ideas, the idea of, you know, that, that Durkheim functionalism would offer and bring them into an examination of popular culture. 
We can take one example, another example of looking at the mass media. The ma what is the function of mass media? For Durkheim, the idea would be if there's an institution that exists in society and it exists across societies, it has to have a purpose. And you know, mass media, all, all societies have some form of mass media. What is the function? And in a de democratic society is to, you know, I would argue that the function of the mass media is to making sure that we have an educated, informed public. Uh, also have the, the, the issue of entertainment, right? People want entertainment, uh, that we live in a world where um, entertainment has a lot of value for us. Leisure has a lot of value for us. So if you look at the, that, it, that the mass media is um, the, you know, important for establishing a democratic society, making sure people are well-educated and well-informed, you can start to see right now, we're gonna have some, some analysis or some discussion about is mass media doing that? What are some of the limits of that? What are some of the restraints that's placed on mass media? Uh, what are the, some of the ways that mass media is structured that's facilitating misinformation, that's facilitating division, uh, rather than collective kind of, uh, you know, more, a more collective um, viewpoint, perspective, a more consensus building perspective, uh, and it's creating more division in, in society itself. Finally, for functionalism, one key thing I want to, you know, I think it's important is looking at values. From a functionalist viewpoint, we have society is built on what Durkheim would talk about a value consensus. He has this concept called the collective conscience. And it's kind of this, you can't establish this empirically, but it's this idea that he believes that within a society, you have the will of society, and the will of society gets expressed through everyday actions and behaviors. Um, so what we're consuming in terms of the mass media is an expression of our collective values. So if we have this sort of mass media that has sort of, let's say, a left and a right version of the mass media, we have almost two different alternative kind of worldviews being provided through the mass media. Durkheim would say that's an expression of our collective conscience. It's an expression of our values, right? And this should give us sort of a little bit of a pause and start to, for Durkheim as well, for we're living in these alternative universes. We have to figure out a way to create a sort of sense of a, of a, a more unified order versus sort of a sense of, you know, of strong, increasingly polarized differences between different camps. But value consensus is an important part of thinking about uh, functionalism. And that idea will be important when we start thinking about conflict theory so we can compare the two. So let's go to conflict theory. Conflict theory, if we had associate Durkheim with functionalism, we'll associate Karl Marx, the big bearded German Karl Marx with uh, conflict theory. A key concept for conflict theory is historical materialism. This is Marx's you know, political philosophy, historical materialism. So he's looking at the history and development of the material order. And material order meaning like how is society organized um, based on a material structure and not material as in like possessions, but rather material as in like the engine of society itself. So the, the material structures that he examined would be going back to hunting and gathering societies or nomadic tribal hunting and gathering, the development of agricultural based societies seven to 10,000 years ago, the rise of industrial capitalism in the 1700s, 18th century. And then we could move forward to, that, that was when Marx was doing his work. And then fast forward to a post-industrial, technologically-based, information-based society starting in the 1970s, 1980s. All of those are different economic kind of structures. And Marx's critique is that when we get to industrial capitalism, we've developed a a material structure that provides advantages for those who are in power, the power elite, as C. Wright Mills would talk about. And uh, the, the numerical few are benefiting from the rest of society, the rest of the workers in society itself. So it's a, it's a class-based analysis of society that we can extend into looking at race, gender identity, uh, sexual orientation, other parts of, of who we are as well. Um, so Marx is going to provide a significant critique. If we go back to the mass media, 
the question of media ownership may be a question that functionalism would look at. Like, okay, does, does um, consolidation of media companies, so they have, we have fewer and fewer today um, than ever before, very few companies control most of what we see. From a functionalist viewpoint, the critique would be, well, that's gonna to start to compromise, and that's gonna to start to maybe create some fracturing in society itself. Conflict theory is gonna provide a different analysis and say, okay, that kind of, of organization was possible because of the power of the dominant actors who are creating regulations to advance their own economic and political interests and needs. Um, and so while both theories can look at the same thing, they're gonna look at it a little bit different way. And it's important that we, be, we start to develop those tools to be able to shift from thinking from one vantage point to be able to think about it from another vantage point. So from a, from a functionalist perspective, we have that value consensus. From a conflict theory perspective, it's this idea of value coercion uh, that we're being forced into, or the general population is being forced into certain values. So I'm going to give you an example in terms of data and data privacy. Okay, so like you, you put a new app on your phone, right? It's asking for all these permissions. Or you sign up for Instagram and Facebook, I mean, Google. Whatever you are using in terms of internet search engines, your phone, your devices, the data that's being collected is a significant part of the business of Facebook and Google. I mean, they make most of their money based on data and data acquisition and selling that data. Um, we lose our privacy in that. Like, you know, and you could say, well, that's an individual choice of being able to do that. Um, I would counter that with that the industry is set up in a way and then engages in practices to coerce us into that particular uh, model, not giving us choices and options within that. And that's intentional and that's by, by design. So that's kind of the idea of value coercion in that regard. And then finally, just kind of one, one idea, which is kind of hard to wrap your head around, but you'll read about it in the um, Gracian articles on conflict theory, is uh, Antonio Gramsci. And Gramsci um, was incarcerated during, during the rise of fascism in Italy. Uh, he was speaking out against Mussolini, and he was put into prison. He wrote his famous The Prison Notebooks during that particular time period. And what he examined is the role of media, the role of um, the cultural industries, the culture industries, in shaping public belief and opinions in ways that reinforce inequalities or reinforce, um, that allow for the ruling class or the fascists to stay in that particular position. And to do that, I mean, he says, you know, that's this idea of hegemony, a domination by consent that power, you can control a population with what's called the state apparatus, like a strong military, a strong police. And that can be important um, for sure. Uh, but Gramsci's argument is that in contemporary modern day societies, it's controlling the way people think, it's controlling their beliefs, like that's much more complete and much more, uh, much more effective as an instrument of control. So it's domination by consent that we agree to our own oppression. Um, and we don't even know we're doing it most of the time. So conflict theory, I like to, I like to sort of always advance the idea uh, that conflict theory is probably the most, has the most optimistic view um, of humans. Doesn't seem like it at first, like, okay, man, what's all this anger coming out from, you know, Marx and conflict theory and stuff, but it was actually comes from a place of great hope, um, optimism of humans, and looking at it that it's the, it's the system that we're living in that's corrupting the human experience. So that we need to become more actively involved in understanding and understanding the system in order to change the system that represents our true values and interests as a human body collective versus the interest of the elite. So that's conflict theory. And then the final one is interactionism, more micro level. Um, individual identities, meanings, perceptions. The tricky part of interactionism, it's all that stuff in terms of symbols, meaning, perceptions, the ways in which we assign meaning to the world. Um, this particular like logos are fascinating. Like, like we know, we've learned it's, that's Hydroflask, right? Being here in Central Oregon, a, a Central Oregon-based company. 
um, go to a different place around the world. It's easy to, easy to understand that they're not going to recognize what that is, right? But then we start to put a lot of meaning into that. Do we, we probably have some ideas about social class and position and environment. Like there's all these things that we start to, the meaning that we give to symbols, right? So interaction is interested in that kind of stuff. Interaction is going to take us all the way from that level, all the way to issues of how does the media shape our perceptions. So it's going to get a little bit tricky. We're going to call it, we call it social constructionism or critical constructionism. So it has a little bit of an element of that, that language, perceptions, meaning, but also kind of wrapping in a little bit of a structure component to it as well. So, I mean, it'll make, it'll make sense. I mean, that's just sort of the broad, broad based perspective for now. So I wish you all well. Drop me a line if you have any questions. Um, yeah, just remember to get the attendance requirement done by Wednesday night, and then your first wiki post by Thursday night, and then comment on your, your individuals in your group by Sunday night at midnight, and then you have the quizzes due by, by Sunday at, at midnight as well. All right, that's it. Uh, have a great week. Take care. Adios.